Thank you, Mr. Secretary. As I told the Secretary behind the curtain, I apologize. I'm like Pavlov's dog. If I hear the announcement southbound to Wilmington, I may leave. Uh, so I, uh, I, uh, I'm sorry. Um, uh, Joe Zabo, Federal Rail Administrator, uh, Mayor Nutter, who has become a great friend and I think is one heck of a mayor, and uh, members of the City Council. Uh, that's a real job. I used to have a job like that. I ran for the Senate because it was too hard. They know where you live. Um, but uh, thank you all for being here. And, uh, and I say to the members of Congress who are here, uh, um, thank you for being here. But I, uh, I, have, to, uh, I have to say, uh, just very bluntly, if I had to pick one person in the United States Congress, one person in the House or the Senate, and I love Allison Swartz, she's the best, but I got to tell you, I got to be straight up, it's Bobby Brady. Uh, if you ever want to be, if you ever need to be in a foxhole, that's the man you want with you. I tell you right now, if he said to me, Joe, I can't tell you why, it's 2 o'clock in the morning, but get in a train or get in a plane or get in a car and meet me on, uh, on uh, you know, uh, broad and whatever, I'd leave and just be there. And uh, Bobby, I appreciate your friendship. There's never been a thing I've asked him to do uh, that relates to this city or this region. He hadn't stepped up and gotten done. So I just want to acknowledge that. I want to thank, uh, thank the mayor again. It's a pleasure to be uh, back in Philly. I kid the mayor when we're at the National Mayor's Conference. I call him my mayor because in Delaware, uh, um, everything uh, from the media uh, to uh, the personnel, it all sort of flows from Philly. And uh, so I am, I'm, I'm delighted to be back in the city. Back when I was a senator, I ended up in 30th Street Station every once in a while. It was probably on those few occasions when I fell asleep on the way home and missed my stop in Wilmington. Uh, and uh, today, uh, and that means that uh, I literally, my dad would define this as a misspent adulthood, I've made over 7,900 round trips between Wilmington, Delaware, and Washington, D.C. Over 200 days a year, 37, 36 years. And I think I only fell asleep, Allison, three times. I think only three times ended up in Philly by accident. But it's a pleasure to be here today to talk about the investments we need to make and if we're going to, as the President said, win the future. And by the way, take away all the jargon, all the rah-rah lines. This is about Right now, 2011, it's about who is going to win the future. There's a fundamentally new competition going on in the rest of the world. We are so far ahead and so better positioned, in spite of our economic difficulties, that we're best positioned. But if we sit back, if we sit back, a lot of other folks are going to eat our lunch. We have to continue to innovate. Let me be clear. We all agree that we need to cut spending to get the deficit under control. That's why uh, I know the Republicans want to do that, and so do we. The President's budget does that. We're prepared to do more. The President's called for a five-year freeze on all spending except for security matters. And he's going to spell out the details of that when the budget comes out next week. We mean it. It's real. And it's going to hurt. It's going to hurt a lot of things we care about, but we have to get it under control. But as President Obama made absolutely clear in his State of the Union message, when it comes to jobs, when it comes to jobs, there are three key places where we cannot compromise. We cannot compromise in education, innovation, or infrastructure. The rest of the world is not compromising on education, infrastructure, or innovation. The most prosperous nations of the future will be those who lead the world in innovation, that create not just the next new products, not just the next new job, but entire new industries to make sure they take root right here at home. It's not enough just to create more jobs. We have to create entire new industries if we're going to lead the world in the 21st century. And if we're going to do that, if we're going to be one of those nations and I know not only we can be, we must be, that we need to commit ourselves to investing in those key areas that everyone knows 
are going to boost the free enterprise system that has always made this country an innovative powerhouse. This is not complicated stuff. It's hard, but it's not complicated. We also need to invest in our schools so that we start cultivating the world's next generation of great innovators. Simply put, we need to out-educate, out-innovate, and out-build all comers. It literally is that basic. It's that simple. If we do not do that, we're going to find ourselves behind, behind in every way. That's how this country became number one. We out-educated, we out-innovated, and, and we also just out-built the rest of the world. Today, I want to focus on outbuilding the competition. And by the way, I hope all countries do well. I really mean that. The better they do, the better we do, because we'll have more places to sell things to, more places to export to. Remember the old bad joke they asked Willie Sutton by why he robbed banks? He said, that's where the people are. I mean, that, that's where the money is. Well, why do we want other countries to prosper? Because if they prosper, they have the people and they can buy our products. That's the stuff that is going to make sure that my grandkids are going to do as well as I did. Because the truth is, even if we have the best people with the best skills and the most innovative ideas, those ideas will never reach their potential without a world-class infrastructure to support them. You're going to get to make uh, — you're making widgets. If it takes 20 percent longer and costs 20 percent more to ship it out of the port of Philadelphia than it does out of the port of Hong Kong, where are you going to send your — where are you going to make your widgets? You're not going to make them in Philadelphia. You're not going to make them in the Delaware Valley. If it takes you twice as long to get your product to market, if it takes twice as long for you to get to market, then where are you going to go where it takes less time? The fact is, public infrastructure investments raises private sector productivity, promotes growth, and actually creates jobs. Not just the job it creates building the infrastructure, the job it creates is a consequence of the increased productivity that flows from that. In a global economy, we can't forget that infrastructure are also the veins and the arteries of commerce. You think about it in those terms. They literally are the veins and the arteries of commerce. You know, if those passageways get clogged, commerce is going to suffer, and it's going to show up in the bottom line, and it shows up really quickly, really quickly. As we grow our economy, as we grow a nation, we need to invest in modern infrastructure that could support the ideas and the changes that have to take place in the 21st century. You know, the next 40 years, <clears throat> 40 years, the United States is expected to increase its population by 100 million people in the next 40 years. 100 million people. By the way, 70 percent of all the people in America live within 50 miles of the Atlantic Ocean and the Pacific Ocean, 70 percent. And you know how congested we are now as a nation. What happens with 100 million more, a significant portion of them being along our coast? So we're going to need that infrastructure that can be able to accommodate more people and more goods than ever before. Folks, we've risen to these challenges before. America has led the world in building in innovating, in transportation, in infrastructure for the last 200 years. That's been the story of the history of the journey of the commerce of this country. In 1830, the first steam engine locomotive, the Tom Thumb, ran along a rickety 13-mile trek from Baltimore to Ellicott Mills in Maryland. But it marked the beginning of a new journey, heading straight into a better, more imaginative future that built the industrial might of America. Now, while the President uh, talks about my being around a long time, it hasn't been quite as long as he thinks, but sometimes it feels like I've spent my entire career promoting rail travel and trying to protect Amtrak, a true American icon, from being cannibalized. Imagine where we'd be were there no Amtrak today after, after all the Pennsylvania Railroad and all the rail passenger rail systems went out of existence. Imagine where we'd be today. This meant over the last 36 years fighting almost every single year to save Amtrak's budget in the Senate. But you know what? Every year we found support from some of the most unlikely sources. 
We found support from mayors and governors from states and small towns far from the coast and Amtrak connected together the, epi the economic hubs and the population centers. People like a mayor named John Smith, who was mayor of Meridian, Mississippi, which built a new transportation hub because a stop on Amtrak line was in his city, revitalized his entire downtown neighborhood, channeling 350,000 passengers through his small town of 40,000 people. Imagine, just imagine where our country would be without rail travel today, passenger rail service. As you know, Amtrak has been both an economic boon and a logistic necessity, both along the Northeast Corridor, which, by the way, produces a $2.4 trillion economy in its own right. $2.4 trillion. And that didn't even count across the country. Between Washington and Philadelphia today, on the line I just came up on, six times as many people got on a train as got on a plane. Six times as many people. And by the way, parenthetically, there's a reason for that. How many more slots can the Philadelphia airport open? How much more traffic can it accommodate? You're already having overflow in the city of Wilmington, Delaware. The airways can only take so much traffic in the lanes. And more than twice as many people take the train between New York and Washington as fly. Twice as many people as fly. That's not only because it's convenient, it's also because there is an inability to actually accommodate much more traffic. The airways are congested. Consider this. If you shut down, and some of you are tired of hearing me saying this stuff, but if you shut down Amtrak's Northeast Corridor, it's estimated you'd have to add seven new lanes to I-95 to accommodate the increased traffic. Shut down the lane, shut down the railroad, everybody who's transiting between on the Northeast Corridor have to get an automobile or a plane. You'd have to build seven new lanes on I-95. And guess what? The construction cost for an average linear mile of one lane through the city of Philadelphia ranges between a minimum of 40 to 50 million dollars. 40 to 50 million dollars for one lane for one mile. We're adding a single extra runway in this land is uh, Hartsfield Jackson Airport. You know what they did? And they just added one. You know what it cost? $1.3 billion. One new runway. So you see, when you talk about the investments we're making in rail, they pale in comparison to what you'd have to make the same investment in runways or highways, interstate highways. And that's before you factor in the environmental benefit of keeping millions of cars off the road, or the cost of delays already caused by already existing increased congestion, congestion in the air and on the highways, or the percentage of flights in the air landing at least two hours late has more than doubled since 1990. I love it when, you know, there's bad weather in Washington or in in Philadelphia, and all of a sudden, everybody has to get on Amtrak, who's never got on it before. And the train's five minutes late, occasionally. And I'll hear grumbling. And I'm like the ombudsman for Amtrak. I'll literally get up and go to those business say, tell me, uh, how long were you waiting at the airport? How long? What do you have to factor in in delays at the airport? Folks, this is the best bargain there is. The traffic's choking our roads, where Americans waste, by these studies done by these econometric models, 4.8 billion hours of lost productivity is estimated as a consequence of congestion every single day, I mean, actually for the year, but every day the congestion on the highway sitting to wait to get to work, $4.8 billion in lost productivity. Remember the old expression? Time's money. Time's money. Look, imagine how much worse all this would be without passenger rail, since surveys show that half of Amtrak's
passengers would drive instead of taking the train, and more than 20,000 more people in the Northeast alone would flood our already clogged airports if tomorrow we shut them down. That is rail. As vital as rail travel is today, it's only going to become more critical tomorrow. We're going to be adding 100 million people in the next 40 years. One need only look at the unrest in the Middle East to know what we have to do to break our dependence on foreign oil. Look how quickly, look how quickly unrest can cause the price of gasoline to skyrocket. What do you think is going to happen in the next 20 years in Saudi Arabia, in Bahrain, in the Gulf, in Nigeria, in Venezuela? What do you think? You think we can take the chance? Do you think we can take the chance of having to remain dependent upon importing 60 percent of our oil from those countries? Now, think about it. An Amtrak train between Philadelphia and New York carries up to 500 passengers. If those folks drove instead, they'd have to use 1,900 gallons of gasoline to get to their destination. The train gets them there with half the energy cost and one-fifth of the environmental damage. But don't just think about those big-picture arguments of all those statistics I just gave you. Think about the difference rail travel makes in everybody's life. I know what it did for me in the Senate. I realize, as I said, uh, you know, commuting four hours a day and doing 7,900 round trips. My father were alive. He'd re if he knew that number, he'd refer to it as a misspent adulthood. But uh, every minute you're stuck in traffic or working your way through an airport security, it's a minute more you could be spending with your families or on your business. Here's how I think of it. As I said, I made 7,900 trips from Wilmington to Washington on the train during my time in the Senate. If I had that time had been reduced by 10 minutes every trip, I would have spent 55 fewer days <laughs> commuting and 55 more days with my family or doing my work. All of this is why, during what President Obama called another Sputnik moment for our country, when we all have to step up our game in order to win the future, our administration has set a goal of ensuring that 80 percent of all Americans, Americans, individual Americans, have convenient access to high-speed rail in the next 25 years. We've already made a significant investment in two areas. First, improving our existing rail lines to make current train service faster. For example, some of you Philadelphians know the Keystone Corridor here, linking uh, Harrisburg and Philadelphia. An investment we made with the help of Senator Specter and Allison Swartz and Bob Brady and other members of the delegation over the last several years has raised the top speed from 90 to 110 miles per hour, cut out more than 20 minutes off the trip. You say, well, so what, Joe? Big deal. Well, it may not seem like a big deal, but when you shave five to ten minutes off travel time, you get to what the transportation experts call a tipping point, where a train ride becomes a better option than a car. So it's no accident. A actual ridership in the Keystone Carter grew more than 50 percent. It grew by more than 400,000 people over the last four years. A million three hundred thousand people make that commute. A million three hundred thousand. The second investment we made is in identifying carters for the creation of what we call world class high speed rail. We're doing that in Florida and in California and other places. Places where you don't have to condemn land that costs exorbitant amounts of money, where you can go in a straight line, where you can move very quickly and move large numbers of people. High-speed carters are where there's big population centers, where the mass and the investment makes sense, and where those carters will set the example for the rest of the country to follow, where, car, where their trains are going to be able to go up to up 240 miles an hour. And you say, what's the big deal? Well, Japan's about to have a train go 300 miles an hour. China has trains that are going 240 miles an hour now. Today, I'm proud to announce the next step. The budget the President's unveiling next week is going to propose a six-year — I'm going to speak in Senate speak here, which I'll translate in a minute — six-year reauthorization of the Surface Transportation Program. The Surface Transportation Program up to now 
has been the money we spend on highways, basically. It currently funds roads and public, urban public transportation, buses and subways in, in ter, intra-city. But we believe it should include intercity rail, rail connecting New York, Washington, Chicago, Minneapolis, etc. So we insist, and we're going to insist with this six-year authorization, that there be a strong Buy America requirement, which is going to help us create tens of thousands of middle-class jobs right here at home. That means construction workers laying track. It means manufacturing workers buying train sets. By the way, nobody, the train sets, these Acela trains, they're not made in America. But if we, the rest of the world, knows, and I've spoken to these foreign leaders, and he's traveled all over the world, they make these train sets in France, and they make them in Spain, and they make them in, in uh, Japan, et cetera. Well, guess what? If they know we're committed in a country of 320 million people and growing, if they know we're committed to high-speed rail, we're going to be making them here in the United States of America. It makes the automobile industry look. These are real, live jobs that pay real good money that people can raise a middle-class family on. It means engineers grading the roots. It means America laying track for a better future. And this is going to require the same type of vision and ambition that led us to develop our interstate highway system more than a half century ago. I hate to admit it, but I'm old enough to remember when there wasn't the Northeast Extension. I was a kid. I used to live in Scranton. We used to go up the long way through Bethlehem to get to Scranton from Wilmington. And they built, when I was about 10 years old, the Northeast Extension. We built the interstate highway system in chunks. We didn't want one day lay down the whole system. Well, what Ray has, and the part of our transportation has, they've got an entire net laid out as to how we're going to deal with these corridors. Today, we're going to do it by focusing on developing three types of rail corridors. We're going to expand access to what we call emerging corridors. Some of you, if you have grandparents, they'll tell you about, people will tell me in Delaware how they used to go from Seaford, Delaware to Wilmington on a train. And they used to get them there quickly and efficiently. Well, about the mid-50s, we decided trains weren't so hot. So we stopped all those kinds of routes. They didn't pay anymore, like linking Brunswick, Maine, with Portland, Maine. That once had a service where it makes good sense to reinstate it. It gives Americans greater access to the national high-speed system as well. And it saves billions of dollars, environmental cost, imported oil, and congestion. We'll increase the number of trips and decrease the travel time in regional corridors with trains run running as fast as 125 miles an hour. And the core, we then, the second category, core express corridors, areas with high speed population density, extreme congestion, excuse me, extreme congestion, and where highway construction costs are almost prohibitive. We'll develop a backbone for this national high-speed rail system, putting trains on dedicated tracks that can reach 220 miles an hour and higher. Our goal, our goal of our next generation high-speed rail system is to build that capacity out in the near term to 1,900 miles worth of highway, only high-speed trains going 220 miles an hour. Right now, our fastest train from New York to Washington in the Excel Express tops out at 135 miles an hour. Average is 81 miles an hour because we get two great big curve, three great big curves, which we straightened out. We can cut the time by a third. Even on the Acela, it takes two hours and 45 minutes to get to New York City. But that's only about 45 minutes faster than it was in 1940. By 2040, we're hoping to cut that time from Washington, New York, to 96 minutes. And we'll insist that every dollar of infrastructure invested is fully paid for, not put in the tab for my grandkids. Our system of high-speed and inner-city rail, inter rail passenger service, that means trains that carry people between cities are going to produce cleaner air, create skilled manufacturing jobs that cannot be outsourced, and fundamentally increase productivity. Right now, nobody in America makes these train sets. 
but our long-term commitment, as I said earlier, is going to give birth to an entire new industry in the United States of America. How do we know this? Because high-speed rail is doing all these things right now. The problem is it's not doing it here in America. It's doing it overseas, not in the United States. This is about competing. It's about leading the world. It's about seizing the future. So let's just take a look at what the rest of the world is doing in a second here. In France, high-speed rail has led more widely spread economic growth in that country and turned what had been quiet towns into major destinations. In Spain, more people travel between Madrid and Seville via high-speed rail than they do by car or airplane combined. It makes sense. It's a six-hour car drive. It's a two-and-a-half-hour train ride. The Spanish have high-speed rail since 1992, and they're planning to build 6,200 miles of new high-speed track, enough to cross the United States and back by 2020. Meanwhile, China, where service began just a couple years ago, they may have more miles of high-speed rail than any other country by the middle of this decade. In Japan, the nation unveiled the first high-speed rail system is already at work building the next line to connect Tokyo and Osaka at, just, at speeds of over 300 miles an hour. Look, I look at these countries and I see no reason why we shouldn't be leading the world. Why? Why? Where is it written that the United States of America can't like it has in every other century? led the world in every new transportation initiative the world has ever seen. There's no reason, none, and there's an overwhelming imperative that we do. The last time America made an investment like this was in rail was during the 1860s. That's when Lincoln, working with the Congress in the midst of the Civil War, passed a thing called the Pacific Railroad Act and supported those acts with land grants and government bonds. Some of my friends, conservative friends, say government shouldn't be involved. Lincoln was in the middle of the Civil War, a good Republican, and he gave a $16,000 bond for every mile of track laid by a private railroad company, increasing probably by 25 years, connecting the East Coast and the West Coast by rail. Some people thought it was a ridiculous investment. Why would a country that's tearing itself apart in a Civil War build a railroad from East to West? Thank God for President Lincoln. He believed, even facing this existential crisis, America always had, always had, always had to lead to the future. So in 1869, when those two sets of tracks met and the golden spike was hammered home, one newspaper wrote, and I quote, we are the youngest of peoples, but we are teaching the world to march forward. If we don't get a grip, folks, they're not only teaching us, they're going to own our kids. We taught the world. As President Obama says, I didn't take this office, nor did he, to settle for second in anything. Look, indeed, we were teaching the world. That railroad was the beginning of a truly national economy that laid the groundwork for economic prosperity in the 19th and 20th century. I just want you to imagine. Imagine a country being able to compete for world economic leadership in the 21st century without a coordinated transportation system that's modern, efficient, environmentally friendly, and truly national. Imagine, literally. Literally, imagine a country being able to lead the world in 2025 without being able to transport large groups of people throughout the world cheaply at high speeds, environmentally sound ways, and with great productivity. It's like imagine us being able to lead the 20th century out the highway system or the aircraft industry, linking every major and most minor cities in America. We believe the investment we're announcing today is the beginning of a transportation of America's transportation network. And let me tell you, if we do not, if we do not take this step now, if we do not seize the future, you tell me, you tell me how America is going to have the opportunity to lead the world economy in the 21st century like we did in the 20th. We cannot settle. We're determined to lead again. 
and this is the beginning of our effort to once again seize the future. I thank you all, and it's beginning right here in Philadelphia. Thank you.